And thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. It is with a genuine heart I welcome you to First Church, a justice seeking and inclusive faith community at the corner of 10th and G. We welcome you in Zoom from wherever you are today. My name is Sam McFerrin. I'm the associate minister here. Our senior minister, Reverend Amanda Hendler Voss, is on vacation and she sends heartfelt regards to each and every one of you. And she is so sorry she cannot be with us today. Today is the day that we remember Jesus' baptism. A day when Jesus comes from out of the depths and God tells us that Jesus is his, God's beloved and brings delight to his eyes and her eyes. And it's the same day that we remember our own baptism, we remember our own belovedness. And this could not be more important because of all that we are bearing. A week that just got heavier. In addition to the surge in COVID, the economic challenges, the weariness of quarantining at home, serving as worker, parent, and teacher, seeing unrest around the world. Here in our home city, we had to witness the violent mob insurrection in our city, in our neighborhood, upon a building known throughout the world as a symbol of hope, openness, and democracy. We mourn the lives lost and we recognize that to get through this, we need one another. And because we know that the arc of history bends toward justice, just like we saw the winds of justice at the beginning of this week in Georgia, low triumphantly. And as people of faith, we know that in the face of darkness, light will always overcome. So we are glad that you are here with us today to restore, to be together, to rest your weary souls, to raise your tired feet, to find comfort and assurance in a God who is meeting you today along your journey. We thank everyone for um, whom is helping make today's service possible. We thank John Horman with the music, Cindy Dobbs to put the worship folder together, Tom Sauer who's helping um, with the video and audio, Michael Hopkins and Freda Sparks, our liturgists, Allison Truhar and Alex Chang, our Zoom moderators. And today is just such a special day because we have the profound privilege of welcoming back Reverend Dr. Audrey Price to our church to provide us with the message. It is prescient for as she is about to embark upon the next chapter of her journey as, as a minister and conference minister, as she heads up to the wintry realm of New England, she decided to stop here to provide a word that I know will be prophetic and will help us on our journey to figure out what God is requiring of us right now. So let us worship, let us worship. And now I invite you all to sing the opening hymn, when Jesus was baptized by John.
Now I invite Michael Hopkins to provide us with the call to worship. Good morning, First Church. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. You are like me, that sentiment has been harder and harder to live with over the past year. The things I can change used to comfortably outweigh the things that I can't. But recently the scale has tipped the other way more and more. A mob of domestic terrorists stormed the Capitol on Wednesday. My dad's chronic illness continues to cause him significant discomfort and pain. A, cl a close relationship was ended by the other person. Some Americans continue to call themselves patriots while refusing to follow the most basic public health guidelines to protect other Americans. When so much is out of my control, I begin to feel powerless and that can be crippling. Sometimes my righteous anger is so engulfing that I lose sight of the things that I actually can control. Sometimes the largely rational anxiety compromises my mental health to the point where I don't have anything left in the tank to do good. Somewhere along the line, it's not really a lack of courage that prevents me from changing the things that I can. It's the lack of emotional resources. I'm not suggesting that we desensitize ourselves to the sickening events in our city. What I'm suggesting is that maybe it's possible to be both horrified and measured in our response, both disgusted and protective of our own health and energy so that we can stay in the ring for the long fight for justice that lies ahead. So join me today in stepping back just for a moment from the white hot flames. Take a deep breath and allow yourself the opportunity to recover from this collective trauma. There's still so much that's outside of our control, but we can't let that paralyze us. We must move forward and we must find a sustainable way to seek justice for our city and our nation. Good morning, First Church. It's good to see you. I'm with my favorite furry friend, Bear. Happy New Year, Bear. Happy New Year, Reverend Sam. It's really nice to see you. You too. But you know what, Reverend Sam? What's that, Bear? This has been a really hard week. Oh, Reverend. Oh, Bear, it's been such a hard week. It really has. Wednesday was so tough. All these Bad things happened that shouldn't have happened. People stormed the Capitol. People got hurt. That should have never happened. I got really worried about my friends and about my neighbors. Oh, Bear, you've got such a good heart. I'm glad you're worried and I, I can understand you're troubled. And God cries when these bad things happen and he prays that they don't happen again and that people learned to listen to their better angels and and learn that doing things like that is never the right thing to do oh reverend sam i know bear i know and i want you to know that you are loved and and, and your feelings are heard and actually there's a great um, story in sunday school that we're going to touch upon uh, today um, it's a story of jesus's baptism oh interesting look how, what's going on well there is this guy john the baptist who is kind of woolly and he wears camel hair and he loves honey honey he sounds like my kind of guy well he has the privilege of bringing jesus down to the river where he is baptized and when jesus goes down the river down like this down and then he comes up up and then once he comes up the sky opens and there's a big bright light and Jesus hears God's voice and say, you are my child. You are my beloved. You bring delight to my eyes. Wow. Wow. I really love that story. And you know, when we get baptized, many of us got baptized when we were babies, we are reminded that we are God's beloved. We bring delight to God's eyes. And we bring delight to God's eyes on our good days and on our not so good days. And we are beloved on days that 
are easy and days that we are struggling. Oh, that, that makes sense. So what we need to do when things are hard is we need to remember our baptism. Remember our belovedness. Remember our worthiness. And remember that to do God's work, God believes in us. So when we do justice, when we act with compassion, and when we include our neighbor, we are with God. And that's the good news. I really like that, Reverend Sam. Thank you so much. Amen. 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 And now with gratitude for, for God in our lives and for this beloved community that we are a part of, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. May peace be with you. Be with you. Peace, peace. 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 Peace be with you. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Hi. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Robert. Peace be with you. Peace, everybody. Hello. Peace, everybody. Peace, everyone. Peace. 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 All right, well, now let us um, let us draw oh, you know, together that's, uh, and oh, that, that's our Jewish husband. husband. Mm -hmm. For a centering moment. Thank you, John. And now I invite Freda Sparks to be our scripture reader. Today's scripture is from Mark's Gospel, 
chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. It tells the story of Jesus' baptism. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my child, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Amen. Thank you, Greta. It is a wonderful joy and privilege to welcome back Reverend Dr. Audrey Price to First Church. She is a leader in both the Potomac Association and the Central Atlantic Conference, but most importantly, she is a friend to our church. In 2018, she served as our supply senior minister during a critical point in the life of the church as we were in a wilderness between senior ministers. She shared her prophetic voice, her, her superb worship planning skills, and brought us through a wonderful Lenten and Easter season. We also remember the extraordinary service where we celebrated the 135th anniversary of when prophet and abolitionist Frederick Douglass preached in our sanctuary on April 16, 1883. She challenged us to live out our faith boldly at the corner of 10th and G, as well as to be engaged in the life of the broader church through both the Potomac Association and the Central Atlantic Conference. From First Church, she brought her gifts to serve as the Assistant Conference Minister for the Central Atlantic Conference. As the Associate Conference Minister, she helped shepherd and provide support to churches and clergy for both the Catoctin and Shenandoah Associations, spanning counties in Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia. This year, we are very proud of her as she is now embarking upon the next chapter in a new adventure. She is leaving the DMV to serve as the Southern New England Conference's first executive for missional implementation. In this role, she will be responsible for operational oversight of the conference, providing leadership for the program staff and the regionally assigned staff and overseeing daily operations, facilities, outdoor ministries and budgets, as well as serve as a member of the executive leadership team. Audrey, we are proud of you. We are grateful that you are a part of our journey and we thank you for the opportunity to provide today's message before you head north. And what we have learned during this time is that it's easy to stay connected. So even though you'll be in New England through Zoom or we're happy, we look, look, we look forward to staying connected and growing from your many ministerial gifts. So thank you so much for being with us today. Amen, thank you, Reverend Sam. Let's see, let me get, uh, I think this would be helpful. Uh, I'm just blessed by the attendance to worship in Zoom. So I'm hoping by spotlighting me that it helped people to find me. Um, I bring you greetings from the Southern New England Conference where I started uh, officially on January 1st, uh, where I serve. And in that beginning, um, I did experience a, a title change where I serve as Executive Minister for Strategic Operations and where the Reverend Darrell Goodwin serves as executive conference minister. I, before I get started, I would like to recognize a few folks who are with us today. One you know very well because he has served faithfully uh, as your associate conference minister, my colleague in ministry, the Reverend Marvin Silver. Bless you, Marvin, for being with us today. 
Also with me, uh, with us today is uh, my beloved uh, spouse, uh, Augustine Angba, who probably is not on video and who I definitely know is not on video, but is with me, with us today is my daughter, uh, who's in Alabama. So Reverend Sam, yes, uh, virtual life has brought us closer together. She resides in Alabama and she's with us today and definitely would not be on video. <laughs> um, if she turned it on, I would be surprised. It is a blessing, as Reverend Sam said so eloquently, um, that in my transit to the Southern New England Conference, that I make this stop. This is my uh, final preaching um, in the Central Atlantic Conference that it would be that it would be with First Church. And so I thank all of those who attended yesterday um, the form, as I was formally released from the Central Atlantic Conference. And I just am grateful for my service and ministry and time that was shared with you. I believe this is our time to to hear a word from God. So beloved, let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Break us, melt us, mold us and fill us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Speak, God, for your people listen. Amen. I want to share with you from the subject, who are you? And I appreciate the scripture that has been read before you and in the recognition of this is Baptism Sunday. Baptism of the Lord Sunday. I, however, want to offer another reading from the Gospel of Matthew to tell the full story of the baptism. Matthew 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 3 through 13, it starts. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and, and all Judea were going out to him and all of the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree therefore does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and the threshing floor will gather his wheat into the granary, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Our focus point is, but when John the Baptist saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming from baptisms, he said to them, you brood of vipers. So my question first church is, who are you? That is the question on this baptism of the Lord Sunday. On this Sunday, we remember the baptism of Jesus. Jesus was foretold in the Hebrew scriptures as part of his earthly ministry. Baptism began his, men, his entrance into ministry, a ministry of service, reconciliation, social justice, transformation, and reform. 
Today, we stop and reflect on Jesus' big day in the Jordan when he was baptized, when the Holy Spirit came upon him and when God presented him to the world saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So we remember the baptism of Jesus. But beloved, we don't stop there. I invite you to remember your baptism or your interest into your faith tradition or your practice of renewal and restoration. To remember the baptism that signified your interest into the Christian church. The baptism that signified your commitment to a lifelong ministry. The baptism that sealed you into the community of faith to do the will of God, the building of the kingdom of God here on earth. On today, we reflect and remember and renew the covenant of our baptism. And in doing so, I ask you, my siblings in Christ, who are you? 2020 and 2021 scream this question to us. We ask it of our religious leaders. We ask it of our national leaders. We ask it of our family members. And we should ask the same of ourselves. Who are we really? It is in this same challenge presented to the Pharisees and the Sadducees when they came to, to John to be baptized. You remember them, right? The self-righteous, the hypocritical, the religious, the national leaders of the Roman Empire who said that they had the people's best interests at heart who prided themselves on knowing uh, the Hebrew scripture or protecting the constitution of the United States, but I digress. Who errantly appealed to and cited the Levitical law, and yet those same people came to be baptized. After all, that would make sense that these well-versed, faithfully educated religious leaders, uh, financially elite persons, would want to be baptized as John the Baptist declared necessary of followers of the way. But do not be deceived. Who are they really? Well, who are they really? John clearly tells us they are brood of vipers. That's who they are, a brood of vipers. Is this a gushing compliment coming from John? Is this a descriptor? Is this descriptor a term of endear endearment? Well, no. John the Baptist condemns the Pharisees and Sadducees as a brood of vipers. A brood of vipers is a family of snakes because vipers are venomous. John was essentially calling the religious leaders deadly sons of serpents. It's quite a bold denunciation and one John repeated to the Pharisees again, captured in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 12. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the religious leaders, the national leaders in Israel during the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. The Pharisees were the law keepers and the promoters of the tradition and conservative views. And the Sadducees comprised the wealthy, ruling, elite class. Over the centuries, these well-meaning groups have become corrupt, legalistic, and, hypo and hypocritical, and would eventually be responsible for crucifying the Son of God. They earned their label of brood of vipers, a nickname with a deeper meaning that is obvious at first glance. Today, let us not be deceived by a brood of vipers. The viper was seen to be an evil creature. Its venom was deadly and it was also devious. The Hebrew scriptures which the Pharisees knew well associated the serpent with Satan. For John to call the Pharisees a brood of viper implies that they bore satanic qualities. 
when John and yes, Jesus called the Pharisees a brood of vipers, they were pointing out that these men were deceitful, dangerous, and wicked. Deceitful in that they were hypocrites, captured in Matthew 23. Dangerous in that they were blind leaders, self-interest leaders, captured in Matthew 15. Wicked in that their hearts were full of murder. Another fascinating detail is found in Jesus' use of the epithet brood of vipers to describe the Pharisees in Matthew 23. You see, Jesus says, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Frame, farmers then and now often burn the stubble of their fields to get the land ready for the next planting season. As the fires near the, the vipers' dens, the snakes would slither away from the flames, but they often did not escape being consumed. Snakes fleeing the fire was a common sight and Jesus' words to the Pharisees would likely have called it to their minds. How could they think they would escape the fire of God's justice by relying on their own works and deeds, which were not at all honest or good? So Jesus and John calling them a brood of viper was meant to make them aware of their own wickedness why do we go through this whole lesson about vipers? Well, let us examine what has become normal in this nation. What has been called normal or has become normal for America is an existence, unfortunately, of two pandemics, not for just a couple of months, not even just for the year 2020, but for decades and in one case of one pandemic for centuries. The first pandemic, COVID-19, as we know is a coronavirus. Well, beloved, it didn't start in 2019, hence its name. It started, the coronavirus was first identified and discovered in 1965, causing the common cold. And then later that decade, researchers found a group of similar and human and animal viruses and named them after their crown-like appearance, hence the name coronavirus. However, that virus was only med medicated. It wasn't eradicated, so it mutated. Let me say that again. That virus in 1965 was medicated, not eradicated, and so it mutated. First church, Beloved community of God, that which the church does not eradicate, mutates. And upon its mutation, the virus grew more resilient, tenacious, and lethal. The pandemic that is among us, the second one is the pandemic of racism. For over 400 years, this nation has been infected with racism. Upon the establishment of this nation, racism was first codified and continued through the forced migration of the African people via the Middle Passage onto this national soil. From enslaving Africans to indentured servitude to the Jim Crow era to assaults of policing and militarization of communities of colors, to the very culmination of the sanctioning of an insurrection by the President of the United States by infiltrating the United States Capitol to not only threaten our democracy, but with the intent to do physical harm to legislative leaders. Racism has only been medicated, but not eradicated. And so it has mutated century after century. I remind you that which the church does not eradicate mutates. And so upon this mutation, racism has grown more resistant, vitriolic and lethal. So what am I saying? The church is not 
called in this time of sinful, sinful pandemic of racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, able bodyism, and all other isms that seek to deny the human dignity of God's beloved community to go into normalcy or complicity or silence. The church is called to be the guy on the porch. The church is called to be hashtag guy on the porch. The church is called just like Jesus and, and John did to say, get out of town, brood of vipers, treasonous pieces of evil. I see the way that when people of color, our neighbors of color were put down by the police brutally during peaceful protests this summer, but yet persons paraded through the District of Columbia with flags, with racial epithets. Those same persons came into our city who respect diversity and yet were not held at bay. I would have none of that. Yes, the church is called to be hashtag guy on the porch. So our word for to, for, from God today is not simply a historical indictment of the Pharisees and Sadducees, not only a warning of the brood of vipers, leaders that we have in our nation, although we need to pay attention and be mindful of them. Our word from God today is for us to reflect upon the ways in which we, in which you and you and you and me to find our voice, or if we have a voice, turn up the volume. Or if we turn up the volume of our voice, add that voluminous, add to that voluminous voice transformative action. So remembering our baptism means that all of First Church becoming like John the Baptist, becoming like Jesus, and becoming like the one among you. Hashtag guy on the porch. It's in your DNA. Because guy on the porch is among you. It's in your DNA. Because your, your leader, your pastor is the voice of justice. It's in your DNA. And so the baptism of the Lord reminds us that Jesus, that God has called you into a collective voice to stand together. Together, we need to move from hashtag guy on the porch to hashtag church on the hill. More deeply on this baptism of the Lord Sunday, as we remember, let us reflect upon and renew our baptismal commitment. It is a call to us for repentance and to denounce our brood of vipers tendencies within us. It is for us to answer truthfully, who am I? Who am I as a contributing member of First Church? Who am I as a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ? Who am I as a witness to justice? Who am I as a transformative agent? Who am I as one who will stand up for the least and the vulnerable? Who am I? Then once you've answered this question, repent it where necessary. Then you rise up, you go to work, faithfully doing the will of God. Beloved, I'm, I'm almost done. This world out there is worth saving. It's needing transformation. Faithful reformers are needed. After his baptism, Jesus came up out of the Jordan and went about, as scripture would say, his father's business. After his baptism, Jesus came up out of the Jordan and went about God's business. 
He went about doing God's work there on earth, healing, preaching, teaching, and reaching people on the margins, dismantling oppressive and corrupt social structures. It's time for you to come up out of the water of the Jordan, go about the work of God's business here on earth, healing, preaching, teaching, reaching people on the margins, and dismantling oppressive and corrupt social, social structures. It is now our time to do the same. It is how you shall remember and honor your baptism. I close with this poem written by the Reverend Delana Taylor McNeck. I stand at the edge of the pool, strangely warm, in spite of the coolness of the water before me, my heart in my throat. As I step into the water, led by the pastor's hand, I make my way down a step at a time. I look around at the family I have found, their smiles and their tears mingled with my own. I look down at the water, friend and foe, at once giver and taker of life. I lay back supported by strong and gentle hands, entering death and life in one swift and vulnerable moment. I offer my life to you in one great wash of water and it closes over me. In that safe moment underneath the water, I am made clean and made whole. Arising, I belong forever. Beloved, in remembering your baptism, ask, who am I? Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Audrey, for your powerful message and Marion for your glorious saying. One of the amazing ways that we live out the life of the church is through our second Sunday offerings. Second Sunday offering is a long standing tradition where the funds raised during this service go to an organization or a cause that the church values, supports, and sees them as an extension of how we live out our faith. Sometimes it goes to critical UCC ministries or global cause or local one. The beneficiaries are determined by our church's social action and awareness committee, and we thank them for their efforts. So this January, the beneficiary of our second Sunday offering is showing up for racial justice, Surge. Surge in DC is part of the Surge National Network of Groups and Individuals working to undermine white supremacy and to do work for racial justice. Through community organizing, mobilizing, and education, Surge moves white people to act as part of a multiracial majority for justice with passion and with accountability. Alicia Garja, co-founder of Black Lives Matter and special projects director at the National Domestic Worker Alliance, put it this way, we need your defecting from white supremacy and changing the narrative of white supremacy by breaking white silence. So let's answer that call. Let us stand up for our brothers and sisters by supporting this prophetic organization. The best way to support Surge is to go to our website. There you can learn both about the life of the church, but you can also support Surge by um, going to the donate button where you can su um, support them through PayPal or Vanco. We thank you all for your generosity and your faithfulness. Now I invite John to lead us in the doxology. Let us come together in prayer, prayer for our community and for our country. I first want to lift up the prayers that I received. We pray for Anissa's family, especially her mom and her aunts, as Anissa's grandmother died last week at the age of 94 due to COVID complications. We pray, pray for Alison Truhar's friend, whose granddaughter died from suicide. We pray for the lonely and the isolated. We pray we continue to celebrate with Suzanne Snyder upon the recovery of her sister, Teresa, from surgery. Her sister's biopsies, Teresa's biopsies, came back negative, which means she won't have to have more surgery. And next week, she'll consult with the doctor about follow-up radiation. We pray for a dear friend of mine and Ryan's soccer coach, Manny Duvall, a Washington DC police officer who was at the Capitol on Wednesday and will be there every day through the inauguration. We pray for his safety, his wife and their son, Kingston. We offer prayers for Olivia Hoynes, who shares she is a dear family member who was a rock to her, who recently received a serious cancer diagnosis. Lord, hear all these prayers. We offer prayers of gratitude for the distribution of the vaccine and say hallelujah for those in our congregation and in our families and friends who have or will soon receive the vaccine. We thank God for the witness of Peter Tracy and his new friend Shanti Humphreys against the insurrection. We thank them for their vehement, honest, and raw testimony against white supremacy. Alison Truhar and Emily Lang wrote it perfectly. I would like to offer a prayer of gratitude for the delight our church's very own Peter Tracy, AKA Guy on Porch, and his fellow DC resident, Shantia Humphreys, AKA Woman in Car, brought into our doom scrolling this week. 
We're grateful to them for giving voice to our feelings and the feelings for many of those in DC and for naming in plain words, the blatant participation in white supremacy by our national and local officials and law enforcement that unfolded right before our eyes on Wednesday and that so many still refuse to see. Friends, what happened this week was tragic and troubling. It pains us to see people storm into, desecrate and defile into the capital, one of the most important places in the planet, a symbol of hope and equality across the world, a current or former workplace for members and friends, and for many of us, a neighborhood gem. On Wednesday, it became a place of bloodshed, insurrection, and death where five people died and we cry and we cry. We saw with our own eyes the starkest example of white supremacy with videos of roaming vigilantes in the nation's capital left unscathed. A radical difference from the National Guard militarized state that the downtown looked like during the peaceful led protests to speak out against the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and others. And while our hearts continue to sink as we had to have difficult conversations with our children about being safe, peeling back their innocent ideas of how adults are supposed to act and how about they are supposed to be safe and cared for always. Friends, we also have to look at ourselves. As members of this country, what could we have done differently to prevent people from thinking that this insurrection, destruction and violence is an acceptable course of action? Were there ways that we may recognize the pernicious evil of white supremacy in our culture, but fail to respond enough to speak out with more volume, to not shy away, and to step forward in the belief that to engage in anti-racist activity, to pursue a faith of beloved community, to work toward dismantling all that separates from us from loving one another fully, this is the work that God is calling us to do. As my mentor, Reverend Roger Gantz shared yesterday, Forgive us for the divisions that have kept us from really knowing one another across the lines of race and religion and class, making us oblivious to the pain, to the real life struggles and joys of people who don't look like us or talk like us and who may live across town, but who are all God's beloved children. We also recognize that the type of love in action is not just required in this capacity but we stand in solidarity with those protesters, especially those in Hong Kong who stood up for democracy and were recently arrested. We applaud the efforts of our own Kellis Wong for the friendship and solidarity she's offering asylum seekers. We stand in solidarity for those adults and children who seek asylum as they leave places that are dangerous. We mourn as there is more and more violence in this city, this home of ours. We pray for peace. Washington, D.C. We are heartbroken and furious that this new administration is planning to again to use capital punishment before their administration time ends. We pray for our homeless brothers and sisters. Finally, be with us, O oh God. Be with us during this time of great uncertainty. Be with us in the gaps when we don't know the way forward, when we're still processing what is going on, where we are still trying to figure out the role and the path forward. Grant us your grace and compassion that helps us become whole, that reminds us of our own belovedness. Grant us listening ears so we can discern your way to be the truth seekers, the community builders, the healers you have called us to be. We know you will, O oh God, as we come together in prayer with the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, please join us in the closing hymn, Lord, make me more holy.
is Lord, Make Me More Holy. After a short introduction, please join the choir and me in singing all four stanzas. Dr. Audrey Price blesses us with the benediction. I just have a few announcements. Um, five minutes after the service ends, we welcome you to a discussion about the 2021 budget. The commissions and the council have worked very hard on this. Uh, this is the budget that will be going up for approval for the annual meeting, which is two weeks from now. Uh, we welcome you to participate in that discussion. Um, Next Sunday is Martin Luther King Sunday. It's going to be a very special service. It's going to be an intergenerational service. Um, we hope you can make it. Immediately after that service, we are going to have a, a, a very special nurture where we are going to um, uplift uh, how we are doing, how we are feeling by inviting three or four people to share their stories on um, what happened on, on, the, on January 6th. And these include uh, Peter Tracy and his friend Shanti Humphreys, uh, Sandy Sorensen and Reverend David Lindsay. Um, it should be a, a wonderful time to, a true meaningful time to come together, um, to, to, to heal, to process and, and to support one another. So we hope you can make it for that special nurture. And then on the 24th, will be the annual meeting. So, um, which is a wonderful way where we affirm our values and, and our hopes for how we uh, strive to live out 2021. And with that, uh, Reverend Dr. Audrey Price, we thank you so much for your friendship, for your, your prophetic word and for your love and support. Thank you, Reverend Sam. It's been a joy to do ministry with you today. Beloved, let us receive our benediction. God has laid claim to your life. By your baptism, you have been marked as God's beloved forever. In grace, may God watch over you. In strength, may you go forth in service. And may the God who hovers over all creation give us wisdom and bless us with peace. Amen.